Thank you, Serena. Now that Josh is gone, I think Adrian's taken the brunt of it. Right. It is good to be back in the pulpit. Um, I feel like a volcano. It's been since July 11th since I preached, so I don't know what's coming at you today. I'm on for the next four weeks straight. God is going to do something I know this fall. I want to do two things this morning as we open the word, and we're going to come to the word. I want to just uh, do kind of a real mini sermon and then intro our series, a bit of a longer one. Uh, I am under no illusions, because this is not my first rodeo, that you are not going to be at the AGM tomorrow night. So I am going to take the opportunity right now and talk about some things that I would talk about then. No, it, it's not boring. So back in June, we did this uh, Celebration Sunday. Uh, and we talked, uh, uh, I did this thing called the State of the Church Address, and I talked about four paths moving forward. And I talked about a mountain as a place of perspective. We can see where, where God has brought us and the paths that he has brought us, and we can see the paths where he wants to take us. And I talked about four paths looking back, online impact, discipleship, global outreach, and finances. And I just want to touch briefly on these four looking forward as we look into this fall. Increasing our online impact was one of the things that I talked about. And so you might think that has nothing to do with me, but yes, it does. There's a lot online now on social media. There's a lot on now with, online with YouTube, and there's going to be even more coming at Sturgeon Alliance for us as a church online. And I can't tell you how important it is for you to share that with your friends. Last uh, this past week, I was at uh, Meet the Community Night in Gibbons, and we had a table there for a church just, you know, just talking about stuff going on in our church, and I had a conversation with all kinds of people, and I had a conversation with someone that I'd never met before, but they bring our kids to youth group, and she says, oh, I see you online. We watch you guys online. I've never seen them before. Maybe they're even watching online. Well, thanks for watching. We don't know how much of an impact we can have just by sharing what we put online. And so I encourage you as we move ahead in this fall to share what is online with others and as we make Jesus famous. Further outreach. Uh, this isn't just our programs at our church, like Sunday morning, small groups and youth groups and other events that we're going to do. This is individual as well. Remember back in the series on, on, on the Gospels, uh, we did a series on the parables, and we looked at, Matt, at Luke chapter 13, where Jesus has a meal with lost people. And I encouraged us, I challenged us, and many of us joined that challenge to have a meal with someone who doesn't know Jesus. Have a meal with a lost person. I don't know how to do evangelism. I don't know how to tear up my faith. Well, can you at least have a meal with someone who doesn't know Christ? That's just the first step. And so I want to challenge us all with our church programs. It's important. We invite people to that. But individually, think about someone every month. Every month, think about someone that you can have a meal with. A lot. Take them out for, to McDonald's. Take them out to the cake. Whatever you can afford. Have them over to your house. Whatever. Think about the lost individually. It's not just the church. It's the church corporately in our programs here. But it's you individually as well. So let's, let's push into further outreach. Give generously. That's money and time. You heard about some opportunities to serve, Serena told about some opportunities to serve, or even join small groups. Can I speak to you just frankly? I need you. We need you. We're understaffed. It's no, it's, it's, it, it's no, no illusion here that, that Josh is gone, but we got a great youth leaders director stepping in, but we're understaffed until God brings us someone. And we got a lot of work to do as we make Jesus famous. Now's the time to step up and serve and give and care for each other. It's been a horrible year and a half. And we're all a mixed bag of awesome underneath, right? All, I, I compare it to like they were in these cylinders and, and, and there's things that build up in our life that cause stress. There's money stuff, there's family stuff, there's relational stuff, there's my job, there's school. There's, uh, and, and, and then finally, if, if it overflows like a volcano, it's like... <sighs> But COVID-19 and all the year and a half has kept that cylinder at about half full. So anything else is added to that, like family or money or this or that, it just makes us closer to the breaking point. We've seen, I've broken, you've broken, we've all broken. Let's understand that about each other and grace in, grace out. Let's care for each other. Let's show empathy to one another. Let's go join our small groups and really listen to each other and care for each other in these next days ahead, okay? So those four paths moving forward. Let's, uh, 
Let's press into those things. All right, first sermon over. But on, next sermon. Here we go. All right. Let's talk about our next series. I'm calling this series Banners. It's from this verse in Song of Psalms. All right. Can I start with a little psychology? Can I go a little bit of Jordan Peterson on us here this morning? Probably one of the most famous psychologists. He's got lots of YouTube videos. If you don't know who that is, just, just, just Google him and you'll find lots of interesting psychology. I had to take a lot of psychology courses in Bible school and seminary. And especially when I was in the youth ministry, took a lot of adolescent psychology courses. And all I remember is they were these really thick books and they were cost about $200 and you tried to sell them at the end of the year. There was a lot of reading with psychology and there's a lot of stuff coming at you as you wanted to learn, especially as a youth pastor, kind of like the, the developmental stuff going on with youth. It just helps you in your spiritual development as well. I don't remember a whole lot about that huge, thick book, but I do remember one thing, and I want to talk about this, and I want you to bear with me because it's all going to make sense as we move along this morning. It's this thing called attachment theory. Attachment theory. Attachment theory is this set of ideas on how we love. It studies people's capacity to, to have trust and confidence in the relationships. Now, there have been encyclopedia sets written on attachment theory. People do their PhD study in this. I'm just going to basically scratch the surface of the Coles notes on attachment theory, but it'll, it'll make sense as, as, we move, as we move along. So this basically argues, this attachment theory, as they study millions of people across cultures, that a strong emotional and physical bond with a caregiver early in life, like a parent or a grandparent, is crucial, is absolutely crucial for someone's development. If they have a place that's a fortress, a shelter, a place of safety in a, in a prickly, unwelcoming, and negative, harsh world, a place where they feel empathy, a place where they feel generosity, a place where they feel honesty, care, and concern, they will be what is called securely attached versus insecurely attached. And from their study, studying millions of people, 50% of the people are, that they study are securely attached. 50% of us are insecure. We're all kind of a mixed bag of both, right? The interesting thing about psychology is right now you're doing, is this me? Is this my family? Is this my friends? And that's okay. That's okay. But it argues that if you have this strong emotional physical bond with a caregiver early in life, you will be securely attached. If you don't have that early in life, you'll be insecurely attached. When my kids were really small, I had, a, uh, Caleb was about two and a half years old. Leah was just born. She was just an infant. And we were living in New Brunswick at the time. And on my day off, I decided we were going to go for a drive. Went off into this long road, the middle of nowhere, this dirt road. Found this beautiful spot. It was the fall. The leaves are turning. And there's this river. And so we got out and our kids were playing. And, and or my, Caleb was playing. And Leah was holding, or Caleb, Leah, Erica was holding Leah just as a newborn. And she was standing next to the car. And Caleb and I started to walk down this path. And for some reason, I saw something off the path, and I walked off the path probably about 10 or 15 yards into some bush, but I could still see him on the path. And then I looked, and because I, I heard some commotion coming up the, from, the, from the path, and I looked, and I saw two of the biggest coyotes with teeth bared running towards my son. Now, what does the mama bear do right then, right? I, I, something flipped in me right away, and I cleared that 10, ten yards in, 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 in a millisecond, and I came out screaming, throwing rocks, and those little coyotes put on the brakes. I, I, I literally thought I was in for a fight of my life. I said, this, this coyote can get one arm, but he ain't getting the other one. He's going to pay for it. And I was really to kill. I was. And there was all this commotion. I showed them in the car. If you don't have that early in life, you don't have that fortress. You don't have that safety. You have someone caring for you, pushing against all the, the nastiness of the world. And you're left to yourself to be your own fortress, your own shelter, your own safety in life. It's going to lead to feeling 
insecure. And so what happens is this insecure attachment and what they study is they notice two common traits in these insecure people. They are anxious and avoidant. They're anxious and avoidant. And they just kind of broke it down into three categories from their study. They're anxious, preoccupied, or they're dismissive avoidant, and they're fearful avoidant. So if you're anxious, preoccupied means you're constantly worrying if someone's going to love you or they're going to betray you in your relationships. You're just constantly worried. Are they going to leave me? Are they going to be? Oh, no, there's, there's, there's friction in this relationship. Oh, no, you're just constantly worried. If you're dismissive avoidant, these, these people are fiercely independent because they learn that they can't depend upon anyone else. And they become super individualistic and they don't need anyone else. And they push them, avoid everyone, push them away from their life. But fearful avoidant is the opposite. They have extreme low view of themselves. Oh, no one would love me. Oh, I'm just worthless. I could never make that team. I could never get that job. No one ever wanted me. No one wanted to marry me. And so they avoid people that way. So that's just a very scratch in the surface of the Coles Notes version of attachment theory. But as a youth pastor for eight years, I had a front row to this seat of this attachment theory. I, grew, I saw, I witnessed kids who grew, up, who grew up not knowing the security of their parents' love. I remember one kid, he came to us in grade nine. I watched him all through high school and then even as a young adult. His dad was an alcoholic. And he left him, his mom, early in life, and he was always hit and miss in his life. So his mom became a workaholic just to survive, working these low-end jobs. His dad was never involved in his life. He lived just down the road from a church, and he came to the church youth group, and he came to know Christ. And I remember later in life, and uh, I actually convinced him to come to Briarcrest, and I was having a conversation with him at Briarcrest, and he was telling me about his upbringing. He said, here's what Christmas was like for me. My mom worked because it was time and a half on that day, so because I wanted to make the money. So here I was, me and my brother, who was an alcoholic and a drug addict. We'd get up on Christmas morning. I'd go to this little tiny tree, and there'd be two presents for me. I'd open them up, and that was my day. I'd eat microwave dinners all day. Now, what are your experiences with Christmas? Maybe that is your experience at Christmas. But most of us, if you come from a, a secure, attached parent, that, that there's a little more family love and, and fellowship going on at Christmas time. But that's his, that's his, that was his life. And so I noticed these unhealthy patterns of behavior and these, the, 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 these uh, unconscious coping mechanisms that came about in his life. He tried to be everyone's friends, tried to have as many friends as possible. He always wanted to be the center of attention. He needed to win. He was this hyper-competitive. He had this amazing leadership ability, amazing music ability, but he would never step into it. He was voted, he was in drama, he was voted in all of New Brunswick, of all the students in drama in all New Brunswick, most likely to succeed in drama. And he would never step into it. Just stay in this high school. He would never step into it past high school. He couldn't commit to anything. Oh, I don't want to talk about the girlfriends that he had. And he, they, they, and just this trail of destruction in his past where he just would push them away for no reason. This relational wake of destruction. There's this, there's this security in our life when we know we're loved. And vice versa, there's this insecurity in our life when that is missing. It leads to this unhealthy patterns of behavior, these, 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 these unconscious coping mechanisms. There's this movie called Goodwill Hunting. Now, I don't super endorse all this, move this, everything about this. There's lots of depravity in this movie. So if you watch this thing, and Pastor Brent thinks this is awesome. It's not. But there, the, if you want to know, to see attachment theory on display, this movie from 1997 with Robin Williams and Matt Damon is a perfect example of that. Matt Damon is beat by his drunk dad, cigarettes put out on him. He was stabbed by his parents. And he grew up not knowing his parents' love. He was a brilliant guy. He was better than all the Harvard grads in math, but he would never step into it. He was, he was a train wreck in relationships, pushing people away. He was always in trouble in the law. And he encounters this, this psychologist, uh, Robin Williams, and, and uh, Robin Williams tries to get to the bottom of it, but he keeps pushing him away. And there's this moving scene in the movie where he takes this file from Matt Damon and he shows him all pictures of where he'd been stabbed and by his parents and all like this. And he throws it on and he says, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. And Matt's like, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. No, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. Yeah, 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 I know. And he keeps pushing towards Matt Damon and then Matt Damon about shoves him away. So what he does, he's avoiding, he's anxious. 
This is not your fault. And then finally, he just breaks down and cries. And it's just a breaking moment in his life where he feels and accepts the love from actually Robin Williams. But here's where I'm going with this. It's a long introduction. There's a security in our life when we know that we're loved. And there's this insecurity in our life when, we, when that's missing. Could that be the, true in our spiritual lives with God? Here's what I want us to consider. Could we have some unconscious coping mechanisms or some unhealthy patterns of behavior in our life based on our understanding of God's love for us? Based on if we feel whether we're secure with God. Not if we are, if we feel like we are. If you're in Christ, you are fully secure. But could we have some unconscious coping mechanisms, some unhealthy patterns of behavior based on our understanding of God's love for us? My one word this year, as I've shared with you, is from the Psalm 91. It goes like this. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. If you don't see God as this safe place of fortress and shelter in this unwelcoming and prickly and negative and harsh world, don't you think there's going to be some restlessness in your soul? Anxious? Anxiousness? Some avoidance? If you don't know that God is this fortress and this shelter in, the, in, in, in this very harsh world, if you don't know that God loves you deep in your soul and it's imprinted upon your heart, you need to be your own fortress. You need to be your own shelter. You need to be your own help and you need to be your own savior. Whew. Song of songs. Let's go there. Let's talk about this verse. Song of Songs is this unique book of the Bible. It's a, it's a short poem or it, it's a love song between a man and a woman. It, it's really a duet. It's, it's, it's a song of songs. It's, it's, it's like saying the King of Kings or the Holy of Holies. You know, when we say Jesus is the King of Kings, like there's kings and then there's, he's the King of Kings. Or there's holy and then there's the Holy of Holies. There's like really, really holy. And so, like it's the ultimate. And so this is, what would you say, is like the ultimate song from which all other love songs come from or derived. The Song of Songs. And it's, and it's, and there's, there's two ways to read this book, and it's purposefully ambiguous. There's a dual purpose to this book. It's meant to be read both literally as a love song between a man and a woman, and later in the song, they get married, you can tell. So a husband and a wife. It's meant to be read literally to help us in our marriage relationships, but it's also meant to be read allegorically or Christologically, big theological word, seeing it through the eyes of Christ, through the New Testament, to help us understand our relationship with God. So it can be read two ways. Literally, to help us in our marriage relationship, relationship, and, or Christologically, to help us in our spiritual relationship with God. Because we know from the Old Testament that God is our, was, is, is the bridegroom, and Israel is the bride. And we know from the New Testament that Jesus is the bridegroom, and we, the church, are his bride. I mean, Paul even talks about this in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 to 32. He weaves these two mysterious relationships together, so you're not quite sure what he's talking about. He says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for it. And then he's like, now I'm talking about a mystery. It's purposefully ambiguous because when you learn about this relationship, one can teach you about the other. The husband and wife relationship and a covenant love relationship is the most common metaphor for this relationship that we have with God in the Bible. So we can read it literally to help us in our marriage relationship. We can also read it Christologically to help us understand our relationship with God. And so in this love song duet, there are these poetic word pictures. And it's poetry. And poetry is, is it's, it's poetry, it's, 
is it's meant to say a lot by saying a little. These highly concentrated words say more by saying less. And one of these word pictures, I want to focus on this morning, but also throughout this whole series, and we're basing this whole series on. And I want you to feel this word picture. I want you to feel it. Feel it, yes, not, not just, just know it up here. I want you to feel it here. I want you to feel Christ's affections for you. You're like, feel? We're supposed to feel? This is church. We're supposed to have some intellectual academic study here about theology and stuff. I, yeah, I understand that. One of the things that I always coached Josh in when he was preaching was this. I said, tone of the passage is tone of the message, period. You're not just asking what is the passage saying. You're asking what is the passage doing, what is it trying to evoke in your heart? What is the Holy Spirit trying to do with that passage right now? So you're not just asking academically, what is it saying? And look it up in the Greek and a lexicon. That's important, but you're asking, what is it doing for the Holy Spirit? So, for instance, when I preach on Revelation, and there's some pretty intense passages there, I'm not meant, the tone of the passage, the tone of the passage is the tone of the message. I don't make it land on a gentle, fluffy pillow for you. There's some edge to it. Or some of harsh, Jesus' harsh things that he said, some of his rebukes, it doesn't land on a gentle, gentle, harsh pillow. But likewise, if I were to preach Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. There better be some gentleness in your voice. It's here in your eye. You don't say, you crazy sheep, why don't you listen to the shepherd? You crazy. You, know, you understand what I'm saying? Tone of the passage. It's tone of the message. And so if this is a love duet song between us and Christ. I want you to feel this word picture. After perhaps one of the most difficult year and a half that all of us have experienced together. I want you to feel this. Let's read this Christologically. He leads me to his banqueting table and his banner over me is love. He leads me. This is the word picture here. There's the, he's trying to say a lot by, by, by saying a little. This is, this, is the, this is the bride speaking. And so he leads me to his banqueting table. So we're speaking. And his banner over me is love. So, so if you are one with Christ, if you are wholly bound to him, you are in a covenant love relationship with him, which means that you have accepted him as your Lord and Savior. You have accepted for what he has done for you on the cross and rose from the dead. He has paid the penalty for your sin, that you are in an eternal relationship with him that lasts forever. And the Holy Spirit now lives in you. You are in this holy bound union, one with Christ, you can experience and feel that, the affections of those words. He leads me to his banqueting table and his banner over me is love. Have you ever been to a restaurant? Banquet table. <laughs> Have you ever been to a, a restaurant or a banquet or, or even a family meal where everything is just right? I mean, like, you, you, just, you can just press pause on all the, the prickliness and the harshness and the news and all that junk going on. And, and you can just be in this moment where the food's just right, the people are just right, the environment's just right. And you laugh till your stomach hurts. And I prayed that that would happen for me this summer, and it did. And I, you, know, you know how good that is? When you laugh until your stomach hurts and the food's... I mean, there's no mayonnaise in any of the food. <laughs> it's just pure bliss. All meat, just like going to Pampa. Yeah. One of those places for me when I was growing up was my grandmother Foster's place. We did this, this exercise in seminary where they asked us, just describe a place from your past that was a safe place, this refuge, this safety, this joy, 
And, and I, I just always came back to my grandmother's house, especially at Christmas time, the meal. And we would usually go over there every Sunday, every other Sunday approximately when I was growing up. And, and my, my grandmother could cook on a wood stove of all that. She cooked everything on a wood stove. She made pork chops taste amazing. She did this unique dish she always made. I don't want it. We call it slum gullion. I don't know what, it's, what it was, but it was amazing. Fresh vegetables from her garden. And I remember just going there and just, just, just pressing pause on the rest of the world and just feeling the love of my grandmother and just eating and feeling nourished right to my bones. I remember when I was 18, I, for the first time, this kid from Nova Scotia went all the way to Saskatchewan to, to, to Bible school that September. And I played hockey on the hockey team. And that Christmas, so like four months after I get there, we're, we, we, we were going to go on this mission trip to Moscow, Russia. So you can imagine this kid left all this comfort in, from Nova Scotia, goes to Saskatchewan, and then he's on a plane going to this foreign world in Russia. And it was, it was great, a great experience. But I remember when I was there, uh, the, the food was very different. <laughs> it wasn't like my grandmother's meal there. And uh, I, I can be a little bit picky, if you notice. <clears throat> Not liking mayonnaise. So perhaps because they didn't feed me a whole lot there, and perhaps because of my own pickiness, I got pretty skinny over the two weeks that I was there. And I was playing a lot of hockey, so I was burning a lot of calories, not bringing a lot in. And so when we came back at Christmas time, most of my hockey buddies lived out west, so they went on a plane almost all the way out west here, and I stopped at Halifax just to go home for Christmas. And my mom said, when I got off the plane, then she looked at me, and her mouth just dropped. She told me this, actually, this summer. She said, you are so skinny. <laughs> you atrophied. You atrophied. You just you shrunk. And she said, all she wanted me to do was take me home and feed me. And I can remember being on that plane across the Atlantic Ocean. And the only plane that I, place that I could think about was going to my grandmother's place, this place of comfort and nourishment for my soul, and sitting at her table and eating and pushing away all the harsh world. Look at me. It's, it, it's been a harsh year and a half, hasn't it? And perhaps... It's a journey that we've all been on, but perhaps because of the journey that we're on, and if we admit maybe even some of our own pickiness and our own issues, <laughs> our soul, our soul has atrophied. And this fall, especially today, I want you to feel, I want you to hear Jesus' invitation to you. If you're in Christ, to come to the table. To have a seat at the table. To, to push away all that stuff. And be nourished in your soul. Have a seat at the table, he's saying. And while you're eating all that food that your soul has just craved so much. There's this commotion going on behind you and he's doing something and then you look and then there's, there's this banner that he's putting over top of your head. Love. I want you to have a seat at the table and experience what it means to sit under the banner of his love. We're calling this series Banners. His banner over me is love. We know what a banner is. We got banners in here. Grace in, grace out, making Jesus famous. We got banners all over town with the garage sale and the election coming up. They proclaim something. They announce something. Here, this is what's important. And if you're one with Christ in a covenant love relationship with him, let me ask you this question. What banner... Do you perceive, what banner do you think God has put over your head? doesn't matter what's there, it's what you think is there, because you're going to live from what you think is there. That's going to be your identity. What do you think the banner over your head, what do you perceive God has put over your head if you're in Christ? 
You see, often we can put these false banners over us, or, or even worse, we can allow others to put this false banner over us, and we start to live from that identity. And it affects all of us, and it leads us to feeling insecurely attached, even though we are securely attached to the Father through Christ. This past summer, when we were in Nova Scotia, uh, anyone done this thing called Entree or Trigo? Basically, it is this ropes course up in the trees. There's different levels of green, blue, black, just like a ski run. Green's easy, blue is intermediate, black is hard. Um, and we found this online, and we did one in BC this summer before, but this one actually claimed to be one of the largest and the best in Canada, in Nova Scotia. And we're like, what, really? We saw some videos online. We're like, wow, we got to go check this out. And so we, we took our, our kids there, and they actually have a black diamond there that is, has a 98% failure rate to it. Now, when you say failure, it doesn't mean you go splat. Uh, this is like a rope score. So you are, are ratcheted in on the top uh, right there. And there's my son doing that. Uh, you're up like four, three to four stories up, in the, up in, the, in the air. And then you do this, this long zip line to another course. And then you do another thing. So these are like swinging things, right? And you have to go from one thing to the next. And, and, and some of them are really, really super hard. But above you, as you notice in this picture, your, your rigging is connected to this cord above you. And there's two hooks. And the way they have this, this rigging fixed is that you can't have both unhooked at the same time. So it's impossible for you to come unhooked. So you have to click this one in before you can unclick this one. And so you can move along or you're going around the tree, clicking in and then clicking in. And then when you go over the obstacles like that, you click both in. And so there's like two arms holding you. And you can only fall about a foot and a half, maybe two feet, if you would actually fall off of those things. But that's, that's really, it's really difficult. I remember watching our... our uh, one of our kids' cousins, Jamie, she did one of the black diamonds. I watched her for an hour and a half do this, and she went through the, all this self-talk, and she's like way up, like four stories in the, in the air, and I'm like trying to coach her through it, and she's like keeping saying, no, I'm not going to fall. I'm securely attached. I'm not going to fall. I'm securely attached. How many of you would do this? You would? <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> but if you don't know if you don't know and you don't trust that you are securely attached to this cord that's right above your head and there's going to be no harm that comes your way, if you don't know and you don't trust, what could be two words that could possibly describe you in that moment if you don't know and you don't trust? Could one of the words be anxious? I'm not doing that. Uh, or avoidant? You're not going to want to do it. If you don't know, but if you do know, if you do know and you do trust that you are securely attached to that cord above your head, don't you think that you can face any obstacle in life with confidence? And the same is true with the love of God. If we don't know that we're securely attached, even though we are, we're going to act all anxious and avoidant. But if we do know deep in our heart that no matter what happens to us, he has us. We're going to act with confidence. If you don't know that, that, that you're securely attached to God, you're going to have these unhealthy patterns of behavior, these unconscious coping mechanisms. You, you're going to be restless in your soul because it all depends upon you. You won't step out in faith when the future looks uncertain. You'll avoid any sense of difficulty in your faith because you feel alone. You're going to have this performance-based religion where you need to, 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 to get God's attention. You always need to see, uh, have others see you as more spiritual. You're, you're, you're going to be bitter because you're going to do things out of obligation rather than oblation. You'll do things because you have to, not because you want to. You're going to have these unhealthy patterns of behavior, these unconscious coping mechanisms in your soul unless you know you're securely attached to the love of God in Christ Jesus. 
this fall, I want to talk about some of those false banners. And we're going to conclude this whole series with our one word service, and we're actually going to call our one word service Banquet Table, <laughs> where we're going to hear stories of where you've experienced the love of God, you've been securely attached. In this song of songs, this duet between a, a man and a woman, what's interesting is, <laughs> I shudder to say this, but the, the woman does most of the talking. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's us. If we're reading it allegorically and Christologically, that's us. We're, we're talking in this story as well, okay, in this duet painting these word pictures. And in throughout this song, if you'll read it, there are many times in this song where the bridegroom is absent and she describes this intense longing to have her, her loved one close. And there is this one line in this song, in this duet song that she repeats three times. It's in chapter two, verse 16, and chapter six, verse three, and chapter seven, verse 10. And it's this one line that pulls her through those difficult times when she doesn't see her beloved one close. Do you know what the line is? I am my beloved's, and my beloved's is mine. So here she is, she isn't close to her one that she has loved, he's off, he's away for some season, and, 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 and she is reminding herself of the security of that love, that even though he's not here, even though I can't see him, I am my beloved's and my beloved's is, and my beloved is mine, or some translations say, I am my beloved's and his desire is for me. Wow. My prayer this fall is that that one line, I am my beloved's and this beloved is mine, would be imprinted upon your, your soul. That we would live from this deep place of security in our Father's love that can only be found in Christ. And that you would know deep in your heart that I am my beloved's and my beloved's is mine. I am my beloved's and his desire is for me. Paul talked about this in Ephesians chapter 3. He says this, and this is my prayer as well. I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have the power together with all the Lord's people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. Wow. It's a love that surpasses knowledge. You can't fill encyclopedia sets of, 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 of academia to, to understand it in your head. You can only experience it in your heart. And my prayer is that you would feel the affections of Jesus this fall. So, this morning, and for the next Sundays to come this fall, I want you to picture Jesus leading you to a banquet table after a long and difficult year and a half and hear him say, eat, eat. And while you're eating, there's this banner over your head that says love. I'm gonna ask the worship team to come. We're going to have a theme song for this series, and we're going to start, we're singing it now. I don't think we've sung it before here at Sturgeon Alliance. It's right from this verse. His banner over me is love. I am my beloved's and he is mine. And maybe this song as we sing it is going to be a prayer for you. Maybe this song is going to be a realization for you. Maybe this song is going to be an invitation for you to, to, to this fall to say, Jesus, I want to know your love that surpasses knowledge. I don't really want to feel your affections for me. This, this fall. So as we sing this song, have a seat at the table and sit under the banner of his love. <laughs>